All right, good afternoon, everyone. Home stretch, yeah? Uh, so I would like to thank, first of all, Dr. Sharma and Dr. Kinney, um, as well as Beth for inviting me to speak once again. Um, this has been an amazing journey. I've been here since the first one. Um, I started when I was 10. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and it's been 21 amazing years. And, uh, and I also want to thank all of you for coming out and, and traveling this journey with us. So um, let's start. I have no disclosures. All right. <clears throat> Cardiovascular disease is the number one cause of death. A major factor um, in uh, a major factor is high cholesterol. High levels of bad cholesterol can lead to uh, the development of plaque in the in the arteries. Atherosclerosis is a multifactorial disease triggered and sustained by different risk factors, such as dyslipidemia, arterial hypertension, diabetes, and smoking. The the degree of lipid in a lipoprotein affects its density. The lower the density of a lipoprotein, the more lipid it contains relative to the protein. The five major types of lipoproteins are chylomicrons, VLDLs, LDLs, HDLs, and IDLs. So, busy slide. Um, by reporting single values for a lipoprotein cholesterol level, um, the traditional lipid panel implies that lipoproteins such as HDLs and IDLs or LDLs are single entities. This slide illustrates that all lipid subfractions are present within a continuum of size and density. With an especially large gradient for the triglyceride-rich lipoproteins, IDL, VLDL, and chylomicrons. Technologies that sort particle size cannot separate IDL and LP little a from LDR, as these particles have overlapping size. They do differ by density, so ultracentrifugation is the best way to separate total LDL from its three components. LP little a, IDL, and real LDL or R LDLR. Each requires different therapies, confers different risk, and has different inheritance. For example, sorry, how do you go back? That way. Um, both LP little a and IDL are more atherogenic than LDL itself. They don't respond to statins, and both are highly inherited and implicated in um, premature CAD. LP little a, or the widowmaker, doubles risk, but when another risk factor, another lipid risk factor, um, such as dense LDL, is also present, the risk leaps to 25 times. LP little a also arises in renal failure um, and is probably partly responsible for the terrible CAD um, in end stage renal disease patients. Okay, here come my big words. Familial hypercholesterolemia uh, is an autosomal dominant genetic disorder caused by a defect on chromosome 19. The defect makes the body unable to remove low density lipoprotein or LDL cholesterol from the body. This results in a high level of LDL in the body. An LDL-C of 190 milligrams or greater in adults, or 160 milligrams um, uh, per deciliter or greater in children, and a family history of elevated cholesterol or early heart disease. Autosomal dominance means you, need, you only need to get the normal gene from one parent in order to inherit the disease. In rare cases, a child may inherit the gene from both parents. When this occurs, the increase in cholesterol level is much more severe. The risk for heart attacks and heart disease are especially high, even in childhood. Individuals with familial hypercholesterolemia are unable to recycle the natural supply of cholesterol that their bodies are constantly producing. Elevated plasma levels of LDLC have consistently shown to be a risk factor in the development of aggressive and premature atherosclerosis, an associated ischemic cardiovascular disease such as MI and stroke. Plasma LDLC levels are highly inheritable, and a number of molecular defects have been shown to underlie extreme levels of LDLC. Familial hypercholesterolemia is identified as an LDLC level of 190 milligrams per deciliter or above in adults and 160 milligrams per deciliter or above in children. Over 90% of people in, with familial hypercholesterolemia have not been properly diagnosed. An estimated 1.3 million people in the United States have it, yet only 10% of them have been properly or actually diagnosed. One in 250 people have it worldwide. 
and it's more prevalent in certain populations, including French Canadians, Ashkenazi Jews, Lebanese and South African Afrikaners. There are two forms of familial hypercholesterolemia. There's the heterozygous type, or the HEFH, and the homozygous type, or the HOFH. In the heterozygous type, the inherited uh, gene mutation comes from one parent. It occurs more frequently occurring in one in 250 people, and occurs, um, it's characterized by very high LDLC levels in a family history of high cholesterol, uh, heart disease or stroke, and typically signs occur in the fourth or fifth decade of life. In the homozygous type, the inherited genetic mutation comes from both parents. Oops. It is more rare, occurring in one in one million people. It is characterized by cholesterol levels well into the 700s to 1000s, and it is aggressive. Atherosclerosis may begin um, before birth and progress uh, rapidly. According to the 2013 ACCHA guideline um, on the treatment of blood cholesterol, four specific patient groups were identified for moderate to high dose statin therapy. Those with a history of atherosclerotic events, uh, the age group between 20 to 75 with an LDLC level of greater than 190, those within the age group of 40 to 75 with diabetes and an LDLC level greater than 70, and those within the age group of 40 to 75 with a 10-year atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease risk greater than or equal to 7.5. Here I'm just showing you the, um, the low, moderate, and high dose levels of the various statins. So as you all know and can see um, from this slide, not all statins are created equally. The half-lives allow us to dose our patients on a daily basis, such as with a torvastatin, or on an every evening basis, such as with simvastatin. So what are the major clinical problems using statins? Why don't we get our patients on those high-dose statins and keep them on them? Well, myalgias, we hear this every day, right? So how do we define myalgias. Well, typically they're bilateral and symmetrical, specifically in the legs, and they're often associated with cramping at night during sleep. The National Health and Nutritional Exam Survey um, collected data from 1999 to 2000. It asked 3,600 Americans um, if they had musculoskeletal pain during the last 30 days among statin users and non-statin users. And it showed that the most common sites of myalgias among statin users are the lower extremities. So how do we manage statin myalgias? Myalgias are a function of statin toxicity, uh, whereby there is a decrease in ubiquinone, or CoQ10, production. So what do we do? Logically, we think, let's give more CoQ10, right? Let's just blast everybody with CoQ10. Well, unfortunately, a randomized clinical trial was done um, in, from 2009 to 2012, which showed uh, the randomization of 120 participants with statin toxicity myalgias and, and randomized them to CoQ10 versus placebo. Um, ultimately, the study showed that only 36% um, could distinguish myalgic symptoms, um, whether on a statin or placebo. Hence, the use of CoQ10 at a 600 milligram daily dose will not improve the pain of those confirmed with statin myalgias. So how do we manage? Well, you know, you can stop the statin, see what happens. Um, if there's no improvement within two to four weeks, maybe you could try another statin. You can try a statin with a longer half-life. You could change the, um, the dosing schedule, maybe to an every other day or three times per week. But I think ultimately what we as practitioners need to do is listen to our patients and listen to their suggestions, yeah? So let's talk a little bit about PCSK9. What is PCSK9? PCSK9 is a proprotein convertase subtilisin kexin type 9. The PCSK9 gene provides instructions for making um, a protein that helps regulate the amount of cholesterol in the bloodstream. The PCSK9 protein appears to control the number of low density lipoprotein or LDL receptors, which are proteins on the surface of cells. These receptors play a critical role in regulating um, blood cholesterol levels. The receptors bind to particles 
uh, called LDLs, which are the primary carriers of cholesterol in the blood. LDL receptors are particularly abundant in the liver, right? the organ responsible for removing most excess cholesterol from the body. The number of LDL receptors on the surface of liver cells determines how quickly cholesterol in the form of LDL is removed from the bloodstream. Studies suggest that the PCSK9 protein helps control blood uh, levels uh, by breaking down LDL receptors before they reach the cell surface. Before we can discuss PCSK9 inhibition, though, we must first understand LDL receptor function. One of the pivotal factors in LDL metabolism is the LDL receptor, um, by virtue of its capacity to bind and subsequently clear cholesterol derived from circulating LDL. A complex of LDLC, LDLR, and PCSK9 um, are internalized into clathrin coated pits, which would be that right there and subsequently undergoes lysosomal degradation. The LDLR is then recycled back to the plasma membrane where it can bind more LDL. This internalization and reshuttling of the receptor toward the plasma membrane uh, is a continuous process which can occur up to 150 times in a life cycle. Elevated low density lipoprotein cholesterol is a major risk factor for cardiovascular disease. Proprotein convertase subtilis and kexin type 9 or PCSK9 is a novel and well-validated target for lowering LDL cholesterol. PCSK9 is a serine protease enzyme that is secreted into the bloodstream by the liver. It binds to LDL receptors extracellularly or intracellularly and promotes degradation of the LDL receptor within hepatocytes. As a result, circulating LDL cholesterol levels can increase. Reducing circulating PCSK9 levels has been shown to reduce LDL cholesterol levels. I felt like I should have done an outfit change. So as the previous video mentioned, by inactivating PCSK9 via inhibition, um, more receptors are available to capture LDL for metabolism and therefore removal from the blood. This illustration merely shows the timeline of developments in the history of PCSK9. In, 2000, in 2003, PCSK9 was first identified. In 2006, loss of function mutations in PCSK9 decreased, decreased LDLC and cardiovascular risk in humans. And in 2015, the FDA approved evolucumab or Repatha and alarocumab or Proluent. Potential targets in the PCSK9 pathway can be aimed at either um, reducing production of expression um, or inhibiting binding or degradation of the receptor. PCSK9 increases levels of LDLC by reducing the available pool of hepatic LDLC receptors. In the absence of PCSK9, the LDL receptor is recycled back to the plasma membrane. Therefore, the binding of PCSK9 prevents LDL receptor recycling and targets, and instead it targets it for lysosomal degradation. Okay, so statins, we know, are the cornerstone of treatment to help regulate cholesterol production. They work well because they inhibit an enzyme involved in the making of cholesterol in the liver and boost the number of LDL receptors to help clear the body of LDL. Available since the late 1980s, statins include the well-known blockbusters that we all know and love, right? Like Simva, Atorvastatin, Rosuvastatin. PCSK9 inhibitors are a newer class of injectable drugs that are monoclonal antibodies, a type of biological drug that has shown to dramatically lower LDL cholesterol levels by up to 60% when combined with a statin. Blocking the activity of PCSK9 with um, monoclonal antibodies reduces the degradation of LDL receptors, therefore increasing, increasing the clearance of LDLC. This is an illustration of the Repatha prefill pen for the 140 milligram dose. This is showing you the um, single-use pre, single pre-filled pushtronic system cartridge for the once monthly 420 milligram dose. Uh, this illustration shows you proluent um, pre-filled pens for both the 75 and the 150 milligram doses, dosages. 
So considerations for PCSK9 treatment focus on um, an important distinction in terms of the usage and insurance coverage. The determination of an inability to tolerate statin therapy is complex and requires assessing whether symptoms are real or perceived, as well as whether alternative therapies such as switching to a different statin or alternating dosing can treat the dyslipidemia. So it's really very important, I think, to distinguish between a patient who has reached their maximally tolerated level of statin therapy versus one who simply cannot tolerate their statin. Um, so in summary, lifestyle changes are really truly so very important, right? Reducing carbs, eliminating sugars, reducing weight, increasing activity and exercise. We want to aim to lower the triglycerides less than 150 milligrams per deciliter. And we want to use the most powerful statins first, like a torvastatin or suvastatin. So despite evidence-based recommendations for the management of hypercholesterolemia, we all know that treatment gaps persist. In addition, um, current treatment options are not uniformly effective and are tolerable for all patients, including those at high risk for atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease and individuals with heterozygous or homozygous familial cholesterol, uh, hypercholesterolemia. PCSK9 inhibition is considered an attractive target for therapy, especially due to the fact that a large por proportion of high-risk patients have subtherapeutic responses to a maximally tolerated statin dose and, or who are intolerant to current pharmacological intervention. We as practitioners, both as um, advanced practice and those, the nurses at the bedside, are at the forefront for the increased identification and need um, for PCSK9 treatment among our patients. We see our patients every day, and for longer periods of time, um, we need to better identify patients um, at risk and in need for PCSK9 inhibitors. Thank you.